This is the land of Havilah, Psalm 74. It's 23 verses. Again, it's a psalm by Asaph, the Levite musical director appointed by David. He outlived David and served in Solomon's time. He performed at the dedication of Solomon's temple, 2 Chronicles 5.12. Verse 1. A contemplation by Asaph. God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance, Mount Zion, in which you have lived. Comment us in verse 1 is Israel. Why have you rejected Israel? Why does your anger smolder against us? Remember us because you took us for your own. You redeemed us from Egypt to be the people of your inheritance, the people you've received unto yourself for eternity, to dwell with them in Zion, the place you've chosen. Coming up, the sanctuary is in ruins and has been for a long time, perpetually it seems. This wasn't the case in Asaph's day. He lived during the absolute peak of the kingdom of Israel. Therefore, the ruin of the sanctuary is prophetic of a coming time. Verse 3. Lift up your feet to the perpetual ruins, all the evil that the enemy has done in the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the middle of your assembly. They've set up their standards as signs. They behaved like men wielding axes, cutting through a thicket of trees. Now they break all its carved work down with hatchet and hammers. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They profaned the dwelling of your name. Come on, this prophecy came to pass twice. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed and burned the temple in 587 B.C., which is about 400 years after Asaph prophesied this. And four Roman legions did the same thing to the temple in 70 A.D., about 1,000 years after Asaph prophesied this. So even as he was performing at the dedication of the first temple, he might have had its destruction in mind, or the destruction of the second temple in mind. Quote, they burned down your sanctuary to the ground. They profaned the dwelling place of your name. End quote. And according to verse 3, the temple would be in seemingly perpetual ruins, as it is to the modern day, gigantic building stones thrown from the temple mount lie in a heap, still lying where they were thrown down in antiquity. But the opening question is why? Why has Yahweh done this? Jesus explained it, speaking of the coming Roman destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, which would be 37 years later. He said, They'll not leave in you one stone on another because you didn't know the time of your visitation, Luke 19.44. So Asaph was correct in verse 1 that God would be angry with them. And in answer to the question why, it was that they didn't know the time of their visitation. It's not an anti-Semitic statement. It's what God declared he would do as far back as Moses. But God also declared, quote, In the latter days you shall return to Yahweh your God and listen to his voice, Deuteronomy 4.30. And, quote, Then Yahweh your God will release you from captivity have compassion on you, and will return and gather you from all peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heavens, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there he'll bring you back into the land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it. Deuteronomy 30, verses 3 to 5. So it would seem like a perpetual rejection by Yahweh, but Yahweh promised he would eventually remember them. Now, speaking of the enemies who had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, verse 8, they said in their heart, we will crush them completely. They burned up all the places in the land where God was worshipped. We see no miraculous signs. There's no longer any prophet, neither is there among us anyone who knows how long. Comment, in a nearly 2,000-year period from the times of the apostles until 1948, Israel saw no prophets or miracles. In fulfillment of verse 9, quote, there's no longer any prophet, neither is there among us anyone who knows how long, end quote. In Asaph's time, prophets were plentiful. He was one himself. But to the Jews in that long period, after the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., it was like Yahweh went silent, and no one knew how long that condition would last, this seeming abandonment by Yahweh. It turned around, or began to turn around, with the reconstitution of Israel in the Promised Land in 1948. Asaph wasn't the first to refer to it. God said it through Moses that he would scatter Israel because of their rebellion, but from the uttermost places, wherever they might be found, he would bring them back into the land which their fathers possessed, Deuteronomy 30, 
verses 3 to 5, which we already quoted. God said in the same passage that he would also circumcise their heart to love Yahweh their God and bring them back to himself. As to how long Yahweh's seeming abandonment would last, verse 10, How long, God, shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you draw back your hand, even your right hand? Take it from your chest and consume them. Comment, we take that to mean, Yahweh, why don't you defend us? Instead of holding your hand in your chest, stretch it out against our enemies. Coming now, a statement of faith that Yahweh will eventually come through. Verse 12. Yet God is my king of old, working salvation throughout the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces. You gave him as food to people and desert creatures. Come at Leviathan's a violent, fire-breathing dragon, Job chapter 41. In this case, he's a poetic figure of Israel's enemies. God will break Israel's enemies in pieces. Coming up, God literally opened up springs in the desert for Israel during the Exodus and dried up the Jordan River so they could cross it. So he's capable of delivering them in the end times. Verse 15. You opened up spring and stream. You dried up mighty rivers. Comment now of his might and authority in general. Verse 16. The day is yours. The night is also yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Comment now provoking God to action. Verse 18. Remember this, that the enemy has mocked you, Yahweh. Foolish people have blasphemed your name. Don't deliver the soul of your dove to wild beasts. Don't forget the life of your poor forever. Honor your covenant, for haunts of violence fill the dark places of the earth. Comment in verse 20, Asaph says to God, honor your covenant. God's early and basic covenant in question here, this is going back even before Moses, is that he promised Abraham that his descendants would possess the land forever, Genesis 17, 8. Asaph's reminding God to honor that covenant in verse 20. Now speaking of the eventual return to the land, verse 21. Don't let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man mocks you all day. Don't forget the voice of your adversaries. The tumult of those who rise up against you ascends continually. Comment in verse 21. Don't let the oppressed return ashamed. But return from where to where? The psalm doesn't say explicitly, but piecing the psalm together with what we know about history, an enemy did indeed destroy the sanctuary and burned it to the ground, as the psalm says. They profaned the dwelling place of his name, as the psalm says, the dwelling place of his name being the sanctuary, the temple, Jerusalem, and specifically the hill in Jerusalem called Zion, according to Scripture, Deuteronomy 12:11 and Ezra 6:12. At the time of that destruction in 70 A.D., they tried to crush Israel completely, as the psalm says, killing many and deporting the rest as slaves in 70 A.D., leaving the land desolated. From then until 1948, it seemed like the land was in perpetual ruins, as the psalm says. The Jews stayed in exile from the land, we know from history. Rather than being at Mount Zion as the eternal possession and inheritance of God that he intended for them to be, as the psalm says, they were absent from the land all that time. So when we get down to verse 21, don't let the oppressed return ashamed. We'd have to say it's speaking of the oppressed Jews who have been returning from all over the world to the land ever since 1948, that it's a prayer God wouldn't put them to shame, that he wouldn't let their enemies triumph over them. Then in verse 23, the tumult of those who rise up against God ascends continually. Given the fact that God returned Israel to the land, the tumult that's rising up against him is in opposition to him returning them. There's a great crowd that doesn't want the Jews in the land, and they continually create a tumult over it. Tumult's a perfect word to describe what's going on. It's all in opposition to what God has done. The prayer in verse 22 is that God will arise and plead his own cause, remember how he's being mocked, and deal with these enemies accordingly. That's the glaring takeaway of it for our generation, according to how your narrator reads it. Quoting verses 21 to 23 again, Don't let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man mocks you all day. Don't forget the voice of your adversaries. 
the tumult of those who rise up against you ascends continually, end quote. May the tumult of those who rise up against God and his returning of Israel to the land die down. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. Psalm 75 is next. 